things like uh, upcoming uh, java sdk and java chain code in the new programming model is similar to composer kind of and uh, also going through the playback of the cloud native support of the chain code container so in the future they are planning to uh, move to the uh, chain code running in a not in a container in a separate uh, as a service so it will oh. improve the performance oh yeah, excellent and oh. uh, and also i gone through that uh, uh, one uh, research paper by the one university in canada about uh-huh. like reaching the 20000 transaction per second in the hyperledger so they suggested some architectural changes so i think it's good i think it's achievable like uh, he mentioned about like uh, in the transaction flow of hyperledger we fabric we generally send the transaction details read write set and everything to the order but yeah. order only we have the only the transaction id to decide the ordering of the transaction in block so we are unnecessarily sending the transaction details like uh, read write set to the order so oh, good. if so if we this kind of changes we can improve the performance to the 20000 transaction per second in fabric wow so So there are there are couple of uh, if you need I will share with that uh, paper I think if you not have. So so yeah if you can uh, I mean this this sounds like a, a nice improvement uh, going forward is this you know is this pu- public and can you share this information or? Yeah, I will send. So actually, uh, actually some uh, research uh, research people uh, tried with this kind of su- uh, improvement suggestion. and there is there is not just theoretical they just uh, practically did on their research lab with uh, five vendors and a couple of uh, uh, using the kafka ordering service and they yeah. achieved this kind of transaction throughput using this changes so they same suggested to the um, our architectural team so they wow. will... yeah it looks to be on uh, my end reading through all that stuff and going through the playbacks it looks like it's potentially based on the um work they had done in testing maybe a, up to a 600% um, performance improvement yeah wow that's impressive well well it's good a, good a, that people are focusing on cuz if right and we all have to extrapolate it back to our own individual use cases cuz these are all benchmarks based on standard use cases but the beauty of it is i was looking at you know conservatively saying okay in a a lot of standard hyperledger fabric you know one four world that exists today i was expecting to be in the uh based on their uh use cases and their uh configured environment i their benchmark was 1800 at least 1800 bytes per second you know tps in a sense on the right side and so i extrapolate that back to my use case and say okay i divide by 4 to get to where we think we're going to be but when i looked at their results and their configuration for the um new model It, it was unbelievable it kicks up out over you know certainly 10 12000 you know they were getting to 20000 transactions uh, per second oh and amazing oh yeah, good it, it, this right, is what we need is, to hear yeah that was crazy so when you look at those numbers all of a sudden you're saying gee if you think about all the use cases that are floating around potentially there's very few use cases that would not fall into scope um with that kind of a an architecture change Excellent. Well, well I'm I'm going to interject here. Uh I I do want to get our, ourselves sort of kicked off officially and then I want to go through some introductions. This is a good conversation but hold hold that thought just as we get started. So, uh we're just past the top of the hour um and so f- for those folks that are brand new, uh first of all, welcome and we'll get to inter- introductions in just a moment. Uh I do want to mention that uh this this uh meeting is recorded uh, and so it's available for people that usually miss the meeting uh they can review it uh we also have an antitrust policy and you should see the screen I, i i believe i am sharing the screen uh this is our antitrust policy notice uh pl- please read through it uh the upshot is uh be a good person that's kind of the takeaway here uh so i'll leave this to you and the link is available in our agenda um and uh if i can ask someone to to please uh just sort of uh take notes for the meeting uh can i get a volunteer oh this is i hear nothing <laughs> okay well so uh so i will i will take notes this time around um that said let's get to in- introductions uh so so jim i don't think we've met before is this your first time uh in the general meeting 
Yeah, and in all honesty, it was an accident. When I clicked on the link, I it, the meeting event I had saved I said it was the architecture. Um, uh, what was it originally? The architecture I oh, think, the ar group. Um, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're this healthcare, and although I'm not healthcare, the reality is um, somebody else who was in healthcare said he thought that my world is automotive and he thought that automotive and healthcare only had a couple items in common. And I got off the phone after talking to him, thought for about 30 minutes and came up with 35 things that are identical between what I call the automotive um, mobility uh, industry and healthcare. So the differences, it sounds idiotic, are actually small. The names are a lot different, but the what we do, what we focus on is uh, probably 89% the same as healthcare with pretty much the same issues. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Uh, well, well, glad to have you here. However, however fleeting it might be, I, I will mention. Uh, however, Jim, we do have uh, a, a healthcare uh, interoperability uh, subgroup that's spinning up that is going to be heavy into architecture. Uh, so, if if you're sort of interested in in you know lending a little bit of your expertise or talent, uh, there there may be a, a great fit for you there. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting when that happens. I'd like to know about that. Okay, great, and and that's a little bit further down in the agenda. Um, and but I could I could certainly connect you with uh, the 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 gentleman that's that's going to be leading that subgroup. Uh, we're already sort of moving forward with a with a use case. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. But great to have you, Jim. And and the conversation uh, just just prior to the the kickoff of the meeting was was interesting and, and worthwhile. Um, okay, and so uh, it looks like uh, maybe one other person, uh, Nisarg is on the line and I don't recognize the name. I wonder if you can introduce yourself. Yes, hi, this is Nisarg and uh, it is my first time. I actually just came across this, uh, uh, you know, the, the forum last night and I was like, okay, let me just uh, join and see what's going on. I'm uh, obviously just curious. I'm actually working on healthcare, uh, you know, telehealth applications and also in the inter interoperability space. And uh, yeah, just curious what's going on in this group. And I'm at the early stages of uh, exploring what capabilities I can bring into my solution. So, you know, really appreciate being uh, on, on the call. Oh, excellent. Well, great, great to have you for, as a first timer. Uh, where are you calling from? Oh, yeah, so I'm, I'm from the Chicago suburbs, Naperville, Illinois. Oh, right. So I, I grew up in the south suburbs, uh, far south, and uh, I have family that lives in St. Charles. So. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, you, right. had a, you had an ice storm not too long ago, if I recall. Yes, we did. We did. <laughs> it All was right. Cold. It's pretty cold today as well, but uh, I think it's getting better. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Great to have you on the line. Uh, and uh, who do you work for or who do you work with? I am the founder of Overtone Health. That's the that's the startup. We're early stage. And we're just running a few pilots, actually, internationally, because, uh, you know, we haven't quite and you know, integrated the HIPAA compliance yet. So yes, we're just running uh, you know early stage pilots and tele uh, remote health management. Uh, right, right now the use case we're we're kind of targeting is prenatal care, and uh, but yeah, we're we're we're, we're going to be open to various other conditions as well. Oh, interesting. So the focus is prenatal care. Um, so one of our other subgroups is doing work with uh, with the donor milk project uh, out of the NICU. So it may, okay. be, it may be some interesting sort of crossover that's happening there. Yeah, most definitely. Actually, prenatal care was more by accident than, uh, you know, actually a plan to get into that segment. It was, uh, you know, I was kind of going after general health management and cardiac, but uh, they, they found me and they're like, no, we can use the same thing. Don't worry about it. So you know, that's... <laughs> You know, when the customer finds you, you cannot say no. You gotta just, you know, keep going and see what happens. So, yeah, we're, we're very early stage. This is our first pilot. Uh, we, we, I wouldn't even call it an MVP. We're kind of, like kind of semi MVP right now. So, yeah. Well, excellent. And and uh, I, I would uh, since you're new to the group, uh, same for, for Jim as well. Uh, if you're interested, we we manage a uh, um, sort of a membership uh, uh, directory. So if you're interested in getting your name and company and contact information up for the sake of this uh, special interest group, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and it's available through, uh, well, through, through this site here. Um, in fact, uh, let me see if I can pull it up real quickly. Um, so here's, the, uh, here's our membership directory. So uh, you can sort of figure out pretty quickly what the, what the syntax is, but feel free to, to to log in and, and edit it, or if you have any issues with that, just contact me and I'll add you to the list. 
Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Well, cool. Great to have you on the call. Yeah, uh, and uh, good, mo good morning, Len and Ravish. We've got some, some names there that uh, I recognize, so excellent to have you. Hi, Rich. Good morning. Morning, Rich and team. Uh, it's um, good to be back again. Excellent. Well, good, good. Okay, well, let's get, uh, we'll get moving with uh, the rest of the agenda. Um, so we do have uh, what, just one community announcement, which is uh, for those of us in the healthcare space, the HIMSS conference is happening uh, next week. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll be flying out uh, in theory tomorrow night. And I say in theory, because here in Seattle, it looks like we're gonna be getting uh, a fairly large snowstorm. So uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get out of the Seattle area. Uh, but that said, uh, the, the great news is we will have uh, quite a few members at the conference. Uh, I think a, about a half a dozen, maybe eight of us will be getting together for a, a sort of a, a social event on Wednesday uh, afternoon evening, which will be great. So I'll get to meet some of you. I think Ravish uh, will be there. Um, and uh, if, if anyone else happens to be attending, please let me know and we'll, we'll try to find a good way to hook you up. Uh, and uh, if you happen to know anyone that's going to be going to the HIMSS conference, uh, I will be uh, at the uh, Hyperledger booth. So I'll be working the Hyperledger booth probably, well, certainly, uh, let's see, Tuesday, Wednesday for sure. Monday, there's a blockchain symposium that I'll be probably at most of the time. But uh, otherwise, if, you, if like I said, if you know someone, I'd, I'd, love, to, I'd love to meet them. Um, and uh, it would be a great opportunity. Uh, is, is anyone planning to attend the conference? Uh, besides Ravish? Okay. Rich, uh, yeah. Rich, quick thing. Uh, unfortunately, I'll not be able to make it. Uh, something has come up on the personal front. So I sincerely apologize. I will not be there this time. Oh, uh, okay. Well, good, good, good for letting me know. Appreciate it. Uh, well, we'll, we'll raise a toast uh, in your absence. Okay. Um, any anyone else want to make an announcement within uh, the group here? All right, and if not, let's go, let's sort of go forward. So uh, let's take a look at our subgroups. Uh, so patient member, and uh, I don't think Ben's going to be on the call. And let's see, uh, I could sort of give you a little bit of an update. So uh, so this is the subgroup that's that's working on the the donor milk project. Uh, and uh, we just recently had um, Marissa uh, Ayanaroni, uh, who's been leading this. Uh, she had to step down for work reasons, and so Ben is now our new lead. So they're sort of transitioning over, and I think Ben actually has, uh, he deferred last week's meeting till uh, a little bit later this morning. I think, um, I think at nine o'clock Pacific is, is when they're doing their meeting today instead of last week. Uh, but where they're at is they're, uh, as I had mentioned before, this is a donor milk project. And uh, what, what, what happened was uh, the customer that they were working with uh, effectively exited the healthcare space. And so they're working right now to identify uh, new uh, customers uh, in the donor milk uh, space that uh, they, could, they could work with to, to continue to move the project forward. And so that's kind of where we're at. Um, so uh, Nisar, it may be something that uh, you may want to connect with uh, Ben on if you're sort of in interested in sort of working that end of, uh, of uh, sort of the, the NICU. And I don't know if the NICU, you know, w w comes close enough to what you guys are doing. Uh, and I don't know how the donor milk project might fit, but it may be an interesting conversation for you to have. Uh, and I'd be happy to make introductions. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, if you can, uh, if you email me your uh, contact information, um, and uh, or you can just let's see, um, probably these. Are, are, uh, are you familiar with our chat, uh, our Hyperledger chat uh, channel? No, actually, this is my first time, but uh, you know, I, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Okay, and if not, just post something in uh, uh, in the uh, in the chat uh, window here, and I could probably pick it up from here. Um, and that's our chat window there. So yeah, okay. Um, so Ravish, you want to talk a little bit about payer? Yeah. So um, which we have been having um, active discussion around, uh, especially around the planning. So I think uh, team decided to. Uh, take a step back. Um, what we are doing from paper paper standpoint, 
I think there was a consensus that since we started the work, we should try to get that to completion or some logical state that it can be published. And I know Jeff was very passionate about it. Engage and you know he'll take a look at it and then we'll we'll, we'll decide how we will get to uh, get that paper to completion. But there is an agreement that we will get uh, a decision framework paper to completion. And there were. A number of ideas, great ideas, came out of that meeting. Um, in a couple meetings that we have had, uh, we have decided to kind of send out a survey to everyone to solicit ideas, and then we will be establishing a plan for 2019. What are the key two or three activities that we will get engaged in in 2019? Um, also, there is um, um, there is. Uh, consensus that we should move the meeting from weekly to bi-weekly schedule so there is enough time for everyone to spend time on the deliverables that we will be working on. Um, just for for everyone, there are two major pieces of focus that we have. One is really looking at the use cases in healthcare and blockchain and then second is going to be related to that is going to be how we can materialize some of those use cases, identify challenges, so on and so forth. And second is a decision framework paper uh, that will be caring towards the payer industry as to what are the key decision points to to va validate a particular use case. Is that a valid use case for blockchain or not? And what are the challenges and focus that you need to have in order to implement a, a, a real solution um, that you can leverage blockchain capabilities to address a challenge um, in payer industry. So that's where we are um, as of now. I think um, the it's, the momentum seems to be coming back. Uh, so there were a good amount of discussion and a number of people joined. I hope it will continue and we will be able to get to a point wherein we will be able to see some key deliver deliverables um, other than talks coming out of the, the group. Excellent. So, so when is your next meeting planned? It is 19th of February. Excellent. Okay, so uh, about 11 days out, you'll have your next meeting, and uh, it sounds like you got uh, some folks that are going to be dialing in, which is good to hear. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that uh, you'll you'll sort of if you if you need to close down the white paper to get it to a point where it's it's a reasonable paper, uh, and and perhaps you might even be able to, to 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 publish it at some point, which is fantastic. So I'm I'm happy to hear about that. Um, and then uh, you said your uh, survey is going to go out. Uh, is that, well, you and I can work on that because it'd be interesting maybe that we put this to full membership as far as the survey goes to perhaps capture uh, additional uh, members that might be interested in the payer subgroup. Uh, but we can talk yeah. about that offline. And Rich, Excellent. just another other thing I wanted to point out for this group to, you know, kind of keep track of what is going on. Uh, if you, if I can request you, uh, Rick, if you don't mind, if you want to, mm, navigate to a pair subgroup and the meeting summary page, it shows all the action items that are assigned to the folks. Uh, let's see, do you want me to, is this, is this the subgroup page? No, just you? the summary, just the second link, meeting index and summary. There we go. Yeah, so, so you see these tasks have been assigned to the teams, um, you know, team members who, you know, based on the discussions we have had. So you see if, you know, as we capture the meeting minutes, you know, with the help of Confluence, you know, the, the, the framework that they have, these action items comes on the summary page. So you can track what is going on in the group, what is the next thing that is someone is working on. So this gives us a way to kind of quickly communicate to the others in the, the overall, you know, SIG. If they are interested in a deliverable that is mentioned here, they can, they can you know, kind of opt for it and so on and so forth. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, I'm going to have to come up to speed on, on how, the, how we do this in Confluence. Excellent. Good, good, good. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to hear about this. This, this, is, this is moving forward very quickly, so excellent. Uh, and if there's, of course, anyone on the call that's uh, interested in following up with uh, Ravish, feel free to do so. And, and that pair subgroup, the next pair subgroup meeting is about 11 days out, so excellent. Okay, uh, and then um, I'll, uh, I'll sort of speak for Stephen. I believe, I don't think, think he's on the call. So, uh, so the healthcare interoperability uh, subgroup is, is fairly new. Uh, we, we sort of kicked that off earlier this month, uh, I should say uh, earlier last month. Uh, and I believe uh, we've got 
uh, at least one use case in the works. The, uh, I don't think the subgroup is officially meeting regularly yet. It's still ad hoc as they try to figure out um, what kind of resources they need. Uh, I think Stephen's going to be putting out a general email to membership uh, to engage people uh, sort of at a broader level. But the upshot is uh, their interest is in sort of working um, instead of sort of a top-down approach, which is kind of the focus of what, what patient is doing with, uh, uh, with the donor milk project. Uh, Stephen is looking at sort of a bottom-up uh, approach, which is really generating services on top of uh, the, the blockchain frameworks. They're using Fabric at the moment. Uh, they're fairly technical in, in how their approach is being made. But the upshot is they're looking to generate interoperability services on top of Fabric. And you can imagine there's value to that because then those services can, can sort of be broadened against other projects sort of at a foundational level. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, we're, it's a fairly new uh, subgroup, um, but there's an awful lot of promise there. So, uh, expect. What that, Rich, what was that subgroup again? Uh, it's called the Healthcare Interoperability Subgroup, and that, and J okay. Jim, this is this is the group that I think you might be interested in uh, dialing in a little bit more on because it's it's going to be fairly technical. They're using Fabric, um, and. Yeah. I, I think the use case they're looking at is immunization. So uh, the idea being uh, tracking uh, children that have been immunized uh, across geographic spaces. Um, and so you can imagine, uh, and they're trying to stay sort of country uh, agnostic. Uh, so they're trying to be a little bit more global in their approach here. But you can imagine if you've got regional areas that manage uh, immunization uh, and those currently today have to coordinate. And so here in the state of Washington, we have a state sort of organized immunization database. Uh, but you can imagine that there, there may be uh, other sort of regional sections going down or more federal yeah. overlook, oversight uh, looking up the tree. So, so that's the work that they're doing. And I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to introduce you to, to Stephen if you're interested. Actually, he jumped onto a Fabric thing and I was on the documentation team for Fabric. Oh, and right. Okay. He and I synced up, and he was the guy that I think I we went back and forth, and he said there what didn't look to be a lot of common stuff, and I came back with, well, wait a minute, we got 35 things in common, and I'm actually working on the same things he's working on now on interoperability, and you're right, the only difference being the use case, but that sounds idiotic, that's irrelevant. We're actually looking at the exact same features. Right, uh, right, right. What's, yeah, off, yeah. what's off chain, how do you link the two? Um, you know, what gets encrypted, what doesn't, but all of those detailed questions on just looking at a different use case instead of immunization and that's it. Yeah, and, and, and the idea there uh, is uh, he wants to sort of, sort of get into it because, uh, you know, the, the perception sort of again being bottom up and service, ser more service oriented is uh, they, they want to sort of shake the tree a bit and understand where some of these uh, sort of sensitive spots are going to be and, and so they're Obviously, we're in a healthcare context here, so their use case is health healthcare specific. But to your point, uh, obviously, you know, you can generate a use case that is not necessarily healthcare related and still yeah. sort of exercise some of the issues that they're up against. So yeah, but, so but he's right. The the services view of the world says all of a sudden you wind up with what I call these common uh, functional services, if you will, that support many many different use cases. And then you look at something like Fabric and say, well, that has a set of features that support some of these services, but really it becomes a library of services ultimately that get consumed by the use cases. So his, his model is a good one. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and, uh, and and I, I see Bob Colley is on the call. So good morning, Bob. Uh, Bob is part of the group uh, with Stephen that, that sort of s spun out uh, the, the concept of a bottom-up approach. Uh, and, and which ultimately sort of led to the, this, this inter interoperability subgroup. Uh, so, so Bob, do you want to talk more on, on this point? Uh, well, I haven't had a chance uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks to intersect with Stephen directly, but I, I look at this, uh, and I'd be interested in Jim's uh, opinion, as analogous, I'm always looking for analogies in uh, in, in these highly technical fields. And it looks analogous to me to, to the healthcare services platform consortium, uh, you know, done by Intermountain and uh, 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 Cerner, uh, the HSPC, which is in the centralized database world, you know, by using FIRES, open APIs, uh, to create interoperable exchange for 
um, you know, EHR vendors trying to develop applications on top of um, uh, of the uh, that uh, consortium's platform. I mean, is that is that somewhere in the right direction, Jim? So, if I, no, Fire in itself is, is a service from my point of view, and it's one of the things we're looking at. We're looking at the, what I call the model above that. So it's I'll call it services models, and then you're right. Fire is just an implementation of that, right? Okay. And so, you, so the, but the concept is we have models for things, different types of models for services. And then we say, okay, and I'm looking across the board and I say, which one am I going to use to implement it? And so one of the things which actually ties back exactly to Hyperledger and probably why you guys are part of the thing is we're not interested in driving down to say we locked in only on one platform. We're trying to be, in a sense, multi-platform and portable across platforms. So if those wow. are you say, geez, I really can't, I can, I can do what I call bindings to implementations from a model. Models are actually become very important because they give you the portability and they give you the abstractions you need to say we're to dive into the single platform stuff and say, here I use, you know, whatever is RDS or big table or something else. And I bound everything, uh, I'll call it tightly to that without a model. Yeah, and, and you, you bring up a good point, Jim. You know, the, if, if you can abstract away from whatever the framework is that you're, that you're sitting on, all the better, because uh, that way, you know, you, it's a very clean implementation. You have very clear distinction of, of interfaces there, uh, and you don't get sort of mired in the details of any one particular framework. So, uh, so, so, so this is, yeah, so this is really interesting stuff. Um, so I, I will... Uh, so Jim, you have a way to contact Stephen, it sounds like, or you've already perhaps uh, connected. Uh, so just to let you know, that's where Stephen's heading with this particular subgroup and it'd be great to have you, uh, you know, participate and certainly help out, uh, at least initially. Yeah, no, I will definitely jump into that because like I say, it, the difference between what I'm doing and what he's doing is 10%. So right, you know, right. it helps me move <laughs> forward. So. Okay, well, good. Okay, um, so I wanted to also uh, sort of walk through status on uh, on some of our ad hoc teams. Uh, so, Ravish, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about our migration over to Confluence and sort of where we are and how that's going? Yeah, so um, I think uh, for most part, uh, going forward, the old wiki has been disabled, so it's read only now. So all the content that will uh, related to wiki will be created on on the new wiki that we have. And um, um, Rick, the overall migration as such, we have not moved a lot of content yet. Uh, the idea is since the old one is gonna be available, we will reference it. But I think the question is, I, I know you raised a, a good question about the, the DocuWiki that um, Mikhail uh, redesigned. I am not sure whether, um, I, I'm not clear as to do we reorganize the content or um, organize it the same way, but yet conform to the templates that are there uh, within the confluence that have been published by, I think there is, there is a template for the meeting minutes, there is a template for the team, um, you know, uh, work group, so on and so forth from, um, I think Dave or, or uh, Linux Foundation. So I have tried to keep the pages for the for the groups um, conforming to the team work group uh, templates, but we do have a home page that we have a question about that we want to answer. Yeah, um, and and I would say the home page particularly, we probably want to make it a little bit more conform with with the template uh, that's being used, just so that since we have members that tend to move sort of uh, laterally across. Uh, some of the SIGs and work groups that uh, you know common common designs should should be probably prevalent here. And I think that's probably where the bulk of the work is going to be because the, the design that was done on, on DocuWiki probably needs to get sort of re sort of re flowed into the the template that uh, that we have through Confluence. And so I think that's where I think that's where the work effort goes, and that was probably the, the purpose, the, the point of the email uh, that I had sent over. And yeah. what, what I would recommend is maybe uh, putting together a, a meeting with the team 
uh, and to, to find a way to sort of, uh, you know, find, find sort of a way forward with the resources that you have available. Uh, and by the way, I'll, I'll just open this up. If anyone on the call is interested, uh, has Confluence experience and is interested in helping out Ravish and his team, uh, feel free to sort of, uh, you know, mention as much. Uh, and I think Ravish, you could probably, you know, pr probably make use of, of the extra resources. Um, uh, yeah, I worked on Confluence in my company as an administrator, so I can provide. Oh, guidance. okay. So, so you, Ravish, you may want to uh, talk with Jim a little bit more about that. Um, by, by the way, Ravish, have you heard from Mikhail uh, at all uh, regarding the the, uh, the the migration? No, no, nothing from him yet. But I will, um, you know, as you mentioned, I will set up a meeting uh, to get together so we can talk it out and figure out the next steps quickly. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, the, uh, obviously, we're we're now officially on Confluence. That's where we're at uh, right here with the page we're looking at, uh, and so at, at least operationally, we're sort of in the Confluence space, and and of course, uh, we're still still a bit of a work in progress. Um, the healthcare uh, special interest group is is one of the oldest, uh, if not the oldest, uh, SIG that we have through Hyperledger projects. Uh, and so we have a lot more sort of uh, maturity or, or I don't know, you could call it overhead or baggage even uh, in, in the wiki. And so there's, a, there's an awful lot more uh, work uh, sort of ahead of us to try to migrate that stuff over in a, in a proper manner. So it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. Okay, well, thanks for that, Ravish. Appreciate it. Um, so moving forward, so the academic research team, I think we're, we, we may, well, so this is in works. And so um, last week, uh, Logan and Adrian and I uh, had a chance to, to meet uh, to talk about uh, the uh, sort of a way forward. Uh, I also received an email, I believe it was last night, from someone who's also very interested in academic research. Uh, the, the purpose of this team is to really uh, understand what the, uh, the, the, the workspace is in the academic world and, and particularly in healthcare. Uh, healthcare tends to make decisions based on, uh, on peer-reviewed uh, uh, outcomes, uh, usually academic papers, uh, sometimes presentations uh, or posters, but uh, healthcare just happens to be very closely wedded to academia and there's obviously a long history with that. Uh, and so what, what, we're, what we're finding is that a lot of our healthcare organizations really won't, won't make a, a, a sort of a commitment uh, to, to even uh, a POC with, with a blockchain solution until there's some sort of rationale behind it. And it tends to need to be objective to the extent that it's possible. Uh, and again, this is just the way that healthcare tends to work. And so uh, this research team is trying to look at ways to uh, make uh, academia sort of a little bit more uh, amenable to the to the blockchain technology space, uh, whether that means trying to understand how to get uh, more publications uh, using blockchain in into the academic sort of workflow for the sake of healthcare, uh, or for helping to maybe collate some of the existing work that's out there. The upshot being, uh, we're 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 just we're very much starved in a lot of objective sort of research uh, in in blockchain within the healthcare context. So the funny part about uh, what you're mentioning about um, peer reviews and analysis um, from a healthcare perspective, everything is built around the concept of trusted data. And what blockchain does fundamentally is sit on the trust side of that equation, right? Right, right. It increases that. So, I mean, it, it, if you look across the idea of doing um, experiments, replication of data sets and all that kind of stuff um, and see what the changes are in tracking all that, then blockchain sort of is a natural fit for that. Yeah, and, and it's ironic. It's just the nature of how decisions get made in the healthcare space that they they expect it to be presented through uh, through these these sort of peer reviewed mechanisms. Uh, uh, but you, you can imagine right now, uh, since it's it's a fairly new technology, uh, everyone sort of has their sort of take on it. Generally speaking, uh, uh, myself and included, uh, as a startup, you you one of the first things you do is you publish a white paper to say how wonderful your solution happens to be. Uh, but that's not objective, that's certainly not peer reviewed. And so, you know, healthcare uh, institutions uh, will not necessarily make decisions based on these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of white papers. They're still waiting for the larger organizations, larger institutions to publish something that is uh, credible. Um, and so that's really kind of the, the position that we're in and we're trying to understand, well, how do we sort of move forward with this? 
Uh, and to, 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 uh, as, as a lead, to, I'll just add, uh, to Adrian's credit, he works with RTI. Uh, RTI is a fairly large organization, uh, and they may actually be lending themselves to uh, helping to vet some of this, uh, some of this work effort. Uh, go, go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, the, the, again, going back to the data challenges, you look at it, and when you're trying to say, okay, I've got a result that I think is outstanding, I've cured cancer or whatever, it is just me saying that. And the whole point of this thing is you look at all of these things, they're what I call a process, as you say, peer review, whether it's just what's a better process to analyze something, or if it's something even for an FDA review or whatever it is in healthcare, whatever the process is, you're trying to figure out, is there a way to, in a sense, shorten the overall cycle time? And speeding what I call peer review is a big deal. And if you look at what I call shared anonymous data sets, which again fits the blockchain model where there's uh, trust on that, you have in a sense broader data sets from multiple sources now that you can in a sense analyze faster and look for differences and variances and so on. And you can do sort of faster analysis that way than just saying, okay, Jim's gonna build his own data sets serially over time and analyze those. Yeah, and I, and of course, the, the I think the technology is sound. the The bigger issue then has more to do with uh, convincing uh, sort of the powers that be in various healthcare institutions that you know that what's being what's being yeah. told and, to them. You know, I, the way I look at it with blockchain, the simple answer is this: you always say, "No, we don't need blockchain. Let's build the best or design the best solution we can without blockchain. Let's do that." And then when you look at that, say, "Okay." Is there any, what are the impacts if I added blockchain in, into this thing correctly? What would change? And then you look at those changes and say, ooh, I really like those. I guess it's worth doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the simple sh shortcut because rather than say, let's go to blockchain, say, no, let's not use blockchain and look at the difference. And that's the fastest analysis I've ever seen to get blockchain in. <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyways, this is uh, this is Nisarg. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to, uh, towards the beginning of the call, I'm running a little pilot, and it happens to be with a research organization. Uh, so, one thing I want to kind of point out is that you know, there's a lot of these academia they do global re global health research, right, and emerging markets and things like that. Right, right. So, so there's a there's a massive use case, and you don't have to tell them it's blockchain, okay, because they, they basically have a huge issue even accessing the data, right? Right, so, right. So uh, I'm actually hitting that roadblock right now, and um, you know it's it's a very clear use case, and you know it's um, you know, I, I don't I don't think they have another way out of it to ricochet out of it. So you know it's uh, you know I'll be I'll be interested in contributing maybe some ideas to this because uh, you know maybe we can even try to bring a quick pilot into market. Uh, you know if 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 there's already some work going on. Yeah. Oh well, good. This, so so this sounds good. So. So as I said, uh, this is sort of spinning up. Uh, there was, um, uh, let's see, Adrian and I sort of started uh, sort of a, a bit of an article on this topic uh, a couple of months ago, and then it just sort of got uh, pushed off a, a little bit because uh, we did an internal reorg here w within Hyperledger. Uh, but, it, but we just recently got a little bit more traction and uh, we've got some additional resources put to it. So uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talk to Adrian um, and see if we can, uh, and I know Logan is doing some work. I think he should have something out by end of day today, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this up to general membership rather than keeping it small so that uh, those of us on today's call, for example, and then uh, for larger membership, uh, this is starting to resonate, I think, at, at, a, at a broader level. And so I, I agree with you, Nisar. This is something that I think probably is going to be touching us a little bit more so than we had originally anticipated. Uh, and I think for that reason, uh, I, I want to open this up. And, and my, I, my, my gut is uh, I'm going to probably uh, recommend that we, we move this to a full subgroup uh, just because I think there's an, uh, enough happening, kind of coalescing around this topic that, that makes it worthwhile to sort of pursue this uh, more than sort of at, at an ad hoc level, because um, this is starting to get real interesting real fast. Okay. Uh, yeah, and they, have, they, have, they have so much so much research just sitting around, or they can't access, and it's in silos. So yeah, there's a massive opportunity. I agree. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, sort of moving forward and, and mindful of time. So as far as the subgroup review team. Uh, so, and, and I think uh, Bob uh, is on, was, was part of that uh, group. We had our final meeting uh, last month, uh, the end of last month, to sort of walk through uh, team objectives. And just as a reminder to, to everyone, 
the the purpose of the subgroup review team was was really twofold. Uh, one to sort of review the state of at that time the E M R subgroup, uh, which sort of was floundering, uh, whether or not we wanted to sort of move forward with trying to sort of res resusc resuscitate the E M R subgroup or uh, or uh, disband it, uh, and possibly in the future sort of reconstituted as an E H R subgroup. Uh, and of course, the purpose of that was really more focused around the E H R space. Um, and then sort of the, the secondary part, and of course we met that first objective, uh, the EMR subgroup was disbanded, and of course we're, we're hopeful that maybe going forward we have an EHR subgroup, uh, but that may or may not happen depending on resources uh, or interest. Uh, and then the second sort of aspect of this uh, review team was to sort of look at sort of the structure uh, of our existing subgroup uh, organization within the SIG, and to make recommendations on any changes going forward on how we may want to consider uh, subgroups uh, being organized uh, going forward uh, within, uh, within the SIG and across SIGs as well. Uh, and the takeaway from that was this notion of whether we have existing top-down solutions, which is really the patient subgroup, uh, where we sort of work with a customer to develop a sort of a, a one-off solution that conceivably can be sort of repurposed for other reasons. Or uh, the, the, the new model, uh, the, which is supplemental, uh, not necessarily replacement, would be a bottom-up solution, which is really the more services, uh, which is a work that's coming out of uh, the, the stuff that uh, Stephen and, and Bob have been doing uh, with what is now going to be the healthcare interoperability subgroup. Um, and so uh, with that, all that sort of done, uh, we decided to, uh, to disband this subgroup, uh, uh, this ad hoc team, I should say. Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to thank, uh, well, so Bob's on the call. I want to thank Bob particularly, and of course the work that's been done uh, by Steven and Mikhail and um, uh, Sonia was, was uh, lead for, for quite a while, uh, and then she had to sort of drop off for work reasons. Uh, so this, this was a group that, a uh, team that did an awful lot of work uh, over the past couple of weeks, so we're very happy for that. So Bob, did you want to add anything more to that as we sort of, uh, sort of close out the subgroup uh, review team? Uh, I'm wondering, uh, is, should there be a, a look at the, the PHR, the patient-facing data that comes out of uh, EHR databases, uh, you know, within the, uh, the, uh, the healthcare interoperability uh, that uh, Stephen and now Jim are in, in, uh, look like going to be involved in? Because of the Apple, uh, all the stuff that's happening with Apple and, and their focus on, you know, the uh, patient-facing, patient uh, health records coming up on smartphones, not just uh, tablets and uh, desktop computers. So that's something I haven't even had a chance to talk to Stephen about, but I, uh, you know, I've collected some information about Apple's entrance into healthcare big time. And uh, that's just one thing that needs to be evaluated from my perspective. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, you know what, Bob, I, I, I put a little blurb at the very bottom for our new business. So I'll, 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 let's hold on the discussion about Apple's influence uh, in the healthcare space because we had a great email uh, sort of a listserv conversation. So I, I want to bring back that bring bring that back to the table in just a short order, uh, just a little while here. So hold yep. that comment because I think that's a good conversation to have. I'm trying to I want to make as much time uh, for us to to sort of focus on that point, uh, so we can get. I just I just need to get through the rest of this stuff. But but good excellent point. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. So uh, so that so. So that's been disbanded. So I'm I'm happy to report that it was excellent work by the team. So going forward, as far as old business goes, uh, as I had mentioned before, um, uh, we had discussed probably about a month or so ago the notion of putting together uh, a way to get folks uh, within membership to uh, collaborate on, on articles and white, white papers sort of outside of, of the SIG. Uh, so that uh, page is officially up, and, and so here's, here's what that looks like. Uh, the upshot is, if you're interested in finding a way to collaborate uh, with someone on a paper uh, that, that either you've con conceived of or that you see that someone else has sort of generated a thesis and you want to write with them, uh, please feel free to use this page uh, to make that happen. Uh, the, the syntax is pretty straightforward. Let me get this out of the way. 
the upshot is if you've got a working title uh, that that'll be in the first sort of a column there, which are sort of a short thesis. So so you're really trying to engage other collaborators who you happen to be, uh, and then collaborators that may be interested in, in joining in uh, into that writing exercise. And and really the, the reason why this happened uh, has to do a lot with a paper that uh, uh, an article that I'm writing uh, that's supposed to go to uh, supposed to go to HBR. I don't know whatever happened to it, uh, but um, I thought, boy, we have you know a thousand members in this special interest group. I should be able to to engage some of those folks to help write this paper rather than me having to sort of do it solo with some other folks. So anyway, so that is available. Feel free to make use of it. The the idea is we've got a thousand folks here in the healthcare space that have interest in blockchain technologies someone's got to be able to have an excellent ability to to write and collaborate on a, on excellent white papers. Uh, so feel free to make use of that as a resource. Um, let's see. So I, let's see. I don't see. Uh, well, so let me let me give you a quick update. So we're, we're trying to get a, uh, a six page sort of summary for the kidney X redesign uh, dialysis prize. Uh, most of you probably know I have a background in 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 kidney care in general, uh, and then here in Seattle we have an awful lot of resources available to us, and so we're hoping to try to put something together by end of month uh, for the sake of this competition, uh, and that's still work in progress. I, I managed to talk to uh, a director for the, what's called the Kidney Research Re Research Institute, which is out of Seattle, uh, and they're also uh, part of the KRI is is judging this competition. So it's a bit of a political thing. I need to be very careful about who I talk to. Uh, but the upshot is we're, we're hoping to continue to move forward with this activity. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you haven't participated in our annual survey, please do so. Uh, I think we have probably about uh, a, a, maybe a dozen or so, uh, maybe a few, few more folks that, that are uh, uh, participated. But with 1,000 people in membership, I mean, that's that's terrible. So we really, really want to ask uh, to get you involved in hearing your voice because that really is going to set the direction going forward for uh, for the year for this special interest group. Uh, and so if you haven't participated in the survey, uh, use the link that you see in front of you, uh, click it. It's a very fairly short survey. Uh, and again, it's really going to help define sort of how membership moves forward. And, and some of the feedback that I've received already is going to be pretty helpful. Uh, to make it a little bit more amenable for for sort of uh, for the group moving forward and where their their particular interests lie. Uh, has any, has anyone not participated in the survey yet? Let me just get a quick quick sense. Yeah, I have not. I don't know. Uh, I'll Jim. I'll, I'll I'll you get a you get a <laughs> you get a buy on that one. All right. Well, so so anyone else that that's part, normally part of this special interest group that hasn't participated in the survey, please please do so. I think the survey will close out in the next I want to say ten days or so. Uh, so please participate. Okay. So uh, I want to bring back around the conversation that Bob, Bob sort of initiated, and this really comes from uh, an excellent email uh, discussion that we had on the listserv uh, probably about a week or two ago regarding uh, a couple announcements that, that sort of happened. Uh, and then and really the question is, how do, we, how do we look at what Apple's doing in the healthcare space? And, and Bob, do you wanna sort of, sort of generate a bit of an in introduction and, and talk a little bit more about uh, what you've seen to this point so far? Well, uh, you know, a Apple, uh, among all of the other, uh, 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 paying companies uh, is under under pressure, uh, along with Facebook and all the, uh, the Twitter. And uh, what I was impressed in reading, and I haven't read it in as much depth as I should have, uh, was that uh, Tim Cook stated on that video, which which came out um, to for the, all the members of the group. I don't know how many people on the call have seen it that he, he looked at, at Apple's major contribution to society of the world uh, as their activities in healthcare, which they're just beginning. Uh, and, I, and I, you know, I obviously don't know Tim Cook, but uh, he's a brilliant guy. And I, don't, I can't imagine why he would state that unless they're gonna put a huge num amount of resources into the healthcare uh, industry. Um, 
and their smartphone is patient facing. I mean, it's a PHR data displayed on, on a handheld device or, you know, or a regular screen, obviously. Uh, so that, those are the, that's the main thing that impressed me, that statement in that video. Uh, and in fact, I don't know if, how many people uh, of, the, of the thousand members have seen that particular video that came out. I can't remember who sent that, uh, uh, put that email uh, out. Uh, I can't remember the name of the person that did it, but uh, uh, he was impressed by, uh, you know, Apple's uh, uh, apparent commitment to taking that huge company and, and uh, making real contributions in, in healthcare globally. So, so yeah, so it's so a really good point, Bob. I mean, um, I guess the way that, that we sort of want to maybe view this is uh, Apple is huge. They have the resources. I think the comment that came out of the listserv conversation uh, suggested that this, you know, this may be just simply another way for Apple to, to sell the hardware. Uh, and of course, they, they have a, a, a certainly a long history in, in being successful in selling hardware. Uh, so I'll just I'll just sort of ask: Is is this something that uh, you know that we expect uh, is going to have any kind of long term impact on sort of on the face of healthcare? Uh, I can tell you that uh, I do know a couple of the folks that. Um, Work in the in the Apple Healthcare space. Uh, in fact, uh, someone uh, used to run uh, one of the organizations up here out of Seattle, and then uh, real sort of got wooed down uh, uh, back down to California to sort of run uh, the the organization. And so they, you know, th these are very very sm smart folks. Uh, my my own sort of take on it is, uh, I, I believe the reason why we're seeing some of these bigger players getting into the healthcare space has less to do with altruism and more to do with uh, data management, that they see tremendous value in the data generated, uh, particularly out of the HRs uh, that relate back, that correlate back to users. And it's simply, if you think of it from a consumer perspective, uh, if these larger players, particularly Apple and Google, for example, uh, Microsoft to some degree, um, if they have access to, uh, to patient data that correlates back to the consumer. This is simply just another facet of defining the consumer, uh, which adds additional value for the sake of uh, marketing, advertising, PR, and so forth. Uh, that's my sort of personal take on it. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear what others think about it and what, what are the, the sort of the short-term, long-term implications of, of what this might mean. So the one thing I'll say about Apple, and it's not just Apple, it's also Facebook, they're stumbling on trying to understand data privacy very badly. So, and they go off in different directions. And so what it is, is we all know about what I call PAI, personal identity information. There's something different, which is I'll call it APD, anonymous personal data, which is not PII, which is a different category. So PII has, is coming under what I call lots of legal restrictions. And we can only sort of forecast what those might be. But when you look at whether it be healthcare or any other field, I'll call it the EPD, anonymous personal data, is a different legal category and will not be covered the same way as um, PII data by any legal regulations for sure. And then of course you have, I'll call it uh, other data, which doesn't fit either one of those categories. It's not, per not personal at all. Like how many cars are there in the US? That's not personal data, that's just other data. So ultimately there'll be those, I think, three categories. And what's gonna happen is we'll have a different set of regulations around what I call APD data than PII data. And as long as the you take, whether it's healthcare information or anything else, and it fits what I call the APD category, um, there will be ways to use that stuff. Um, whereas the PII stuff, as in a sense, the technology, the software technology gets better, ultimately that stuff may be I'll call it, locked away and hidden forever. Um, under the control of the user, which is actually not a bad thing. So Tim Cook has talked about that, but um, it's that middle ground, I'll call it the APD data, that he's yet to define in his healthcare initiative for sure. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that while it sounds like, oh yes, this would all be on your iPhone, in reality it's not. Uh, in fact, it actually becomes another blockchain application because all of these, your personal health records have to be decentralized data. 
They cannot sit on a device alone because if you lost the device or it got destroyed, you have no healthcare records. So therefore, by nature, it has to be decentralized. And because you want it locally available, most likely something like blockchain or Kafka type technology that distributes that data will be part of the underlying platform as well. So yeah, so so interesting point on on that last point. Uh, yeah, I, I imagine you know some some notion of sharding will have to happen just to keep. Uh, information sort of distributed in a way that makes a lot of sense that uh, is, uh, well, is distri either distributed or decentralized. The, the other point uh, re regarding anonymity, you know, I, I read an interesting couple of papers that suggested that uh, if you have enough sort of disparate data, uh, you can sort of restructure uh, someone's identity um, based on, on the bits and pieces that sort of are representative of who that individual might be. Yeah, but I think that I, I agree with you, but I think the legal thing, it's absolutely true. So if I'm the only man over 70 in a town that has 30 people, well, then I, I'm it. You know, yeah. so after 70 <laughs> had a hamburger, well, it had to be Jim. Yeah. But for the most part, minus that, that what I call unique uh, outlier, because um, I am that old. But the deal is I would look at the rest of the world and say, I don't think the PII, uh, the whole PII model and how it's being targeted correctly for closer regulation and all that, um, we'll, they'll have boundaries, if you will, over what APD looks like, clearer boundaries than we have today, to your point. And, yeah. and you're right that, sure, you can say, you know, who lives in a neighborhood that makes between 50 and 60,000 a year who went to Cornell? It's not PII data, but you're right, that APD data could hone in on me. You know, as an example. Yeah, so it, it's an. Uh, and I don't think there's a solution per se, but it's certainly an interesting exercise. Given you know that you can sort of uh, triangulate to the point where you can infer an awful lot, and uh, of course, machine learning AI is really good at doing this uh, to the point where the question of is is anonymous data truly anonymous? I think that's that's going to be an interesting discussion point. Maybe well, what it is is the PII is confirmed data, right? It's, it's accurate data, unlike APD data, which is, as you say, derived to a level of confidence. It's a completely different thing. And so, right. yes, who uses it to say, I think I'll send an email to Jim or pop this up on his browser. So, yes, m many, in a sense, organizations will use the APD data for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, be, I'm sure there will also be restrictions on APD, but there'll be nothing like the PII data. The PII stuff, like G GDPR and all that other stuff, you look at those restrictions, they're phenomenal. APD data will also have restrictions, but not the same, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, it's, this is, I totally agree, but isn't that an exciting field and time that we'll all enter into? Because both Apple and Amazon have targeted the healthcare space to, um, to do major, you might say, improvements in their capabilities and services that they provide to um, <laughs> Joe Blog, the general public. So in, in Apple's case, they already have the smartwatch, which already um, they're able to capture a lot of health data. And now they're extending that to capture, I think, electrocardium, cardiogram data which is personal right. to the to the wearer to the user so they're not going to be getting <laughs> provided data from the doctors and the hospitals and the clinics out there that would be shared with them but you and i as we purchase these devices and we now start collecting our fitness and our healthcare data that's going to be available for you and me as the number of capabilities on these smartwatches or smartphones increase so they see that they see that market, and they see the potential for putting for putting healthcare more in the hands of the consumer, each individual patient, which will be which will augment, sorry, which will augment the data and the services provided by you know our healthcare organisations and clinics. So I think that seems to be the strategy because they have a massive investment in these areas. It's really wait and see, <laughs> but very exciting from my perspective. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so yeah, my, I, I'm my, sorry. But I, I add one thing is that uh, a common uh, rhythm disturbance in, a, in humans is atrial fibrillation. And the, 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 the uh, state of the art was a, uh, a two-week uh, uh, remote, uh, two-week uh, uh, cardiac monitoring device that they stick on your chest uh, and records every heartbeat. Uh, so to go from that, which was the state of the art, 
to the smartwatch, uh, the uh, uh, Cardia uh, uh, Alive Core company for $99. If you're one of these people that develops atrial fibrillation paroxysmally, uh, you know, it's a huge valuable uh, uh, tool that's just recently been created and is certainly not overpriced. Uh, and, and there are millions of people, may, uh, atrial fibrillation may be 10 or 15% of the population over seven. So uh, that's, a, that's the perspective, I think. They wanna sell their watches, they've got that, uh, you know, that uh, permanent uh, uh, customer base uh, as people get older. So good, good point, Bob, and we're going to have to leave it here. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, let's call it uh, a day. Uh, so thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Uh, Rich and team, thanks for the meeting. Have a, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.